Good afternoon, everyone. You're probably going to catch a few seconds of me looking at my screen while I was trying to um, pull up some pages. But anyway, I hope you're all well. Um, it looks like the uh, the Yorkshire clique has been broken up. I was reading your comments while I was trying to find some pages to show you. Um, from all the various different regions of the world, welcome to the Greys Westminster live stream on this very fine and sunny Tuesday. I hope you're all well. Um, before I forget, as always, if you're not a subscriber, please subscribe. Most of you are subscribers, I'm pretty sure, but if you're not or you're just catching this for the first time, um, please do hit the subscribe button and the bell icon so that you know when we live stream. And if you're happy to contribute to the coffee fund, you can do through th do so through Super Chat or you can also um, click the PayPal link that we have now because we're coming slowly in the, to the 21st century. Um, someone actually sent me an entire bucket of coffee. <laughs> not, no, I'm not joking. It was a bucket. Um, I've just been told by the, the people that are in the shop today that there is a bucket of coffee. Um, <laughs> they're waiting for me when I go back in a few days time. So thank you. You know who you are, who sent that. <laughs> I'm not saying that everyone has to send me buckets of coffee. Please don't. <laughs> just coffee fund is also fine. All right, so today I wanted to talk about slightly unconventional uses for your lenses because so many people have um, what we fondly call gear acquisition syndrome and I'm not saying you shouldn't buy more equipment, please do, and if you do, please buy it from us. <laughs> but, but there are um, certain ways that you can get around using a lens that you might think is only designed for one purpose and in fact use it for an entirely different purpose. I talked a little bit about this last Tuesday um, when I was talking about doing portraits of flowers and how you could use any lens pretty much as a close-up lens, not a macro lens but a close-up lens. But then I thought, and a friend of mine who works for um, Mark Roberts, which is Mark Roberts Motion Control, is a robotics company that's owned by Nikon. Um, and he had been taking landscape shots with his telephoto lens. And I thought, huh, it's a very good point. I have done the same, not as much as I'd like to, I have to admit, because up until my um, semi permanent loan of the 500 PF, I don't really have much in the way of telephotos. My only telephoto is my little 200 f4 AI. That's the longest lens that I own. Oh, thank you, Robert. Thank you so much. Yay, everyone. Give Robert a round of applause, please. Thank you um, for your contribution to the Coffee Fund. So the this is the longest lens that I own aside from the the sort of on temporary loan 500 PF that I'm currently borrowing from the shop um, until until I have to give it back, <laughs> which I don't want to. Um, and Simon Stafford had very kindly sent me some pictures, used um, this lens to take pictures that you wouldn't normally uh, take with a 500 PF. And I had been finding the same thing. I was doing lots of close-ups with the 500 PF because the telephoto lenses do this wonderful thing of actually isolating the subject from the background. So you can kind of do not macro, but you can do close-up or um, select out details with a telephoto lens. You can also use it for landscape. So I'm going to show you some examples of how to do that. I haven't done any landscape with this, but Simon very kindly sent me some pictures with his vast selection of telephoto lenses that he has used over the years for things like landscape. Um, yes, <laughs> we go round of applause emojis. Um, sorry to anyone that I missed. Um, hello to all of you from Toronto and Ed in Mexico and uh, the wilds of Worcestershire and Berkshire and <laughs> Bromsgrove. This is all very exotic places. <laughs> all right, so, so first I wanted to cover telephoto lenses, but then I will also talk about various uses of wide angles and macro lenses and using those for things that aren't typically what they're used for. Um, essentially, if you know these few kind of tricks, and the thing I talk about this all the time, you have your subject, here is your subject, this is my panda succulent, and you have the front of the lens on the camera and you have the background. And if the three things, if the lens is close to the subject, as close as it can be, and if the subject is far away from the background, then you can actually basically blur your background and not necessarily cheat, but get a close up look with just moving yourself and the object away from the background rather than 
buying a macro lens so you can get closer or um, if you're like me sometimes I just take one prime lens out with me I'm gonna talk about primes and zooms as well but sometimes I just take one lens out with me and then I have to kind of live with the fact that I've just got the one lens so the 200 before you wouldn't think that this is a lens you can do everything with but you can do a lot with it not everything but a considerable amount so I'm going to show you some pictures that Simon um, sent me and the first thing I'm going to do is actually get them ready <laughs> which is always a good idea here we go and I also have some notes about um, the different settings that he used but I'm going to just switch over here first so this because some of them I know off the top of my head and others I don't I actually had um, took a note of what he'd said so this is a close-up shot taken with the 500 PF, so the 500 mil f5.6 PF, and you can just see how much subject isolation there is um, against the background. The background has gone. It's fantastic. This is also the 500 PF, another great example. These are all Simon's, um, Simon Stafford's pictures, by the way. Um, this is another one by Simon, again, with the 500 PF. Now, the next one, I actually have to look at my notes because I made a note, but then I forgot to connect my printer <laughs> to tell me what these shots were. So this one, number six, here we go. This is actually the 200 to 400 F4 used at 300 millimeter. Isn't that interesting? So that's another use of a telephoto lens um, for kind of close-up work. Now, a lot of people, when you say telephoto lens, they don't automatically think landscape. It's a very uncommon use for it, but it's very, very useful. And I'm sure a lot of you have done it. It's great for getting rid of elements in a scene that you don't want. So this, for example, and you get this lovely kind of also layered effect with your telephoto lenses when you're shooting landscapes with them, which I've noticed more so with telephoto lenses. I haven't yet worked out the science behind it, but um, I'm sure that there's actually a reason why you get very clear cut layers in your landscape pictures when you're shooting with a telephoto lens. Um, so let me just have Simon remind me here, this is number five. So this is Dawn in the Ariage. Actually, sorry, that Lupin was the 500 PF. I beg your pardon. Um, this is the 300 100 pf um, that he used for this one also another great little lens but a, a telephoto the chestnut tree here we go landscape landscape picture taken with the 200 to 400 so this one was also taken with the 500 pf but this one here was taken with the 200 to 400 at 300 millimeter um, this one here let's have a look this is number seven so this one was taken also with the 300 pf again it's very much a landscape shot, but you can isolate your subject quite well with um, with a telephoto using it for a landscape. Uh, so the next one is taken with the 70 to 200 FL lens, um, which I guess is also kind of a travel shot uh, and which telephoto lenses definitely do get classed as. They get classed as travel and wildlife and sports lenses. But And in fact, on the Nikon website, I'll show you in a minute, they actually put them in the travel and landscape category because they kind of bundle all that together. But you could also consider this a form of uh, form of landscape because it's got the, the background in there as well. Um, this is another beautiful landscape, which was taken with, this is number nine, taken also with the 70 to 200 FL. Um, and I love the fact that because Simon has used a telephoto lens in this shot, you kind of get rid of all the unnecessary extras. And if he was, let's say, using a 1424 or something that you would typically expect to use for it, then the main subject of this picture would kind of get lost because there would be so much background. Um, this last one, I think this is the, no, it's not the last one, there we go. This one is New York. Uh, and was taken with the ah now this one's an interesting one this one was taken with the 1755 I should probably put that in a slightly different category but it's interesting 1755 DX which is on uh, a full frame camera is the equivalent of an 82 and a half millimeter lens so it's kind of a landscape, it's kind of a street shot. <laughs> it's kind of a bit of everything, actually, which is very, very interesting. This one is, again, a landscape shot taken with the 500 F4G, which is the much bigger version of the 500 5.6 PF. If you're familiar with it, it looks a bit like a bazooka. And then this last one here, which is 
actually it's a beautiful beautiful picture um, and it's kind of a combination of shots but this is the 200 to 400 um, there's a lot of background in there as well so you could class it as a wildlife shot I suppose but also you wouldn't necessarily need to sorry that was my mouse <laughs> so it, has a, it has a mind of its own um, and then a couple that I just threw in here because they're, they're my own shots but using a telephoto lens like a 500 pf for subject isolation again this is a 200 this is the 200 f4 that I keep talking about all the time the little AI lens which you can also use for portraiture so those are some examples now um, I want to talk about once I've switched over to me there we go I wanted to talk to you a little bit about some of the tricks and the caveats and the importance of understanding how certain focal lengths work at different um, ends of the lens and things like that. So as I talked about, the closer your lens gets to your subject, essentially, the shallower the depth of field will become. I talk about this all the time. I think I've mentioned it at least half a dozen times since I started these streams, if not more. Um, and the more you remove your subject further away from the background, um, essentially the more isolated the subject becomes, which is why these telephoto lenses work so well when you've got a subject um, that's very separate from the background. But telephoto lenses themselves have a slightly different depth of field effect to a wide angle lens. It is just the way it is. So if you want to take just a telly out with you, just a telephoto, um, yeah, David Yarrow, I'm very familiar with David. <laughs> As you probably know, he comes into the shop all the time. Um, I'm going to talk about wide angle lenses in a minute. I don't have any of David's shots to hand, but I will talk about using wide angles for um, unintended purposes as well. Um, but thank you, Pranil. That's very kind of you. So, um, so for example, I quite often will go out with one super wide angle, like a little, um, as I talked about the other day, the 28 mil or 35 is my usual go-to. And then I'll take a telephoto and the telephoto will stay on most of the time because you can actually do so much with a telephoto lens. Um, as I said, I personally don't have anything longer, but I've used an awful lot of long lenses. And I'm also gonna talk about a little bit later some of the ranges of lenses or the kind of logical things that you should put in your kit bag um, that complement each other quite nicely and some of the misconceptions let's say about these lenses um, so when it comes to doing landscape photography with a telephoto lens or otherwise there is a thing I don't want to scare everyone off right at the beginning of the stream but there is a thing that some of you may be familiar with called a hyperfocal distance now essentially all the hyperfocal distance is it sounds very very complicated but it's not it is essentially the the optimum distance that you can shoot with a lens that will allow the subject to be in perfect focus and still have everything up to infinity in perfect focus so Whereas when you talk about um, a subject being close to a lens and everything blurred out, this is the opposite. This is using a telephoto lens for landscape or any lens for landscape. What you sometimes want to calculate doesn't always work. It doesn't always apply. It really depends on what kind of picture you're after. But if you, for example, would like to... Um, to have a have you you have your entire frame in focus you would need to find ideally and a lot of people just use a rule of thumb like a third of the way into the frame is the way to do it but if you actually know the exact perfect hyperfocal distance of your lens then you will get acceptable sharpness right up to infinity um uh, uh, the reason i'm mentioning this is actually because someone who um is a very very good client let's say of us and um, regularly emails me with his pictures and um, he sent me an email last week or a few days ago and just said look one of my pictures is not super sharp I'm using this old lens I think he was using actually this lens or an early version of it um, and the subjects in the very far distance aren't as sharp as I would like them to be there's a few reasons for that and I will talk about the various different reasons because a lot of people ask these questions. Um, but one of the things that you can do if you are going to shoot with a telephoto lens for landscape and you want to make sure that you get the whole thing in focus is just to know your hyperfocal distance. Um, now, there's actually a calculator for this. So I'm going to show you that, but I'm also just going to show you this, um, this article. I don't know if any of you are familiar with uh, the Cambridge in Colour 
photography learning pages. They are very, very handy. Um, and sometimes they just use simple terms to explain quite compl complicated concepts, I would say. Sometimes their articles are quite complicated, but they have a sort of simplified version and then a, a little bit more complex version for, for very difficult things. So let me just um, flip over to that once I flip my screen over, sorry, my shortcuts weren't where they were supposed to be. So this, this website, which is very, very handy, this is Cambridge in Colour. This is a whole article on the subject of hyperfocal distance, but I thought, why bother to try and create my own version when these guys have done a great job? <laughs> so they've done a fantastic job, so I'm going to show you what they did. So this you might be familiar with. This is front focus. This is a bit what I'm talking about, you know, taking the subject closer to the lens and then the background is blurred out or you've got back focus where you focus right at the back and the subject in the front or the foreground is nice and blurred out. And then you've got front center focus, which is kind of, if you're calculating the correct hyperfocal distance, means you'll have acceptable sharpness both front and back. Um, now, I don't want to overburden you with complexities, but there is a hyperfocal chart calculator on this website, which is very useful. So let's say, you want to go out with your 500 millimeter PF and you want to shoot some landscapes with it and you want to make sure that what's in the background all the way up to infinity is in focus. Then you would need to know what the hyperfocal distance is between your camera and infinity. So the quickest way to do that is to pick your camera off this list. So for example, I've got a full frame camera, so I'm going to pick that. Um, now, let's say you don't have these lenses. Let's say I don't have a 135, but I've got a 200 and I've got a 500. Um, yep, 80. Well, let's say I've got a 105. I've got a, I've actually got a 55. Uh, 35 was actually fine. A 20, let's say a 28 and a 20. So those are all the lenses that I might, I'm never going to take all these lenses out in a day. But let's just say that those are the lenses I want to calculate the hyperfocal distance for. And then you'll see when I show you, once you click calculate, it tells you what the hyperfocal distance is based on the aperture of your lens. So for example, here with the 500 PF, which is a 5.6 lens. So the hyperfocal distance is 1395 meters. You might want it in feet. I, I think in both, but, um, but that's the hyperfocal distance for that lens. Whereas the 200 is an F4, and 300 meters is the hyperfocal distance for that lens. Whilst my 20 mil 1.8 actually doesn't have 1.8 as an option, but I'm probably not gonna be shooting at 1.8 anyway. Um, it would only be four and a half meters, for example. Obviously depth of field pays, plays a big part in this, and I'm gonna just explain depth of field. I've talked about diffraction before. You don't generally wanna use these smaller apertures when you're shooting landscape, or when you're shooting anything, in fact, because you will end up with a problem called diffraction. And that is covered in this, it's actually covered down here um, on the subject of diffraction and how it will, it will cause a problem. So this is an article certainly worth reading, and I can put a link to it later um, at the bottom of the stream if it's helpful. So generally speaking, as a kind of rule of thumb, a third of the way through the scene is the place to focus. But if you do want to be very specific, you can calculate the hyperfocal distance using a simple online calculator. You don't have to get too fancy about it. Um, you can, <laughs> don't click this button unless you want to, um, you can get very advanced, but this will just give you a guide so that if you are planning to take out your telephoto lens um, for landscape or a bit of everything, at least you know when you go out with that lens what the hyperfocal distance will be. Um, now, let me just, nope, not that one, that one, sorry. <laughs> let me just talk very quickly about diffraction. I've talked about it before. I'm going to talk about it again. Um, so I'm just going to look at the comments while I'm doing this. Some lenses have the depth of field scale for various apertures on the lens barrel. Yes, this is true, Nick. Absolutely. Um, yeah, the good old F90 will work it out for you. Select the back and front and it will work out the aperture required to cover the focus range. That is so clever. I didn't know that. All right, well, there we go. So you can use an online calculator. You can also use the basic rule of thumb of a third of the way through the frame and do a little bit of trial and error. The problem with using small apertures, and you will need to use a small aperture if you want everything in focus, particularly with the telephoto lens, because telephoto lenses do, they compress the depth of field, so you end up with a much smaller depth of field the closer you get to the subject. So 
you want to make sure that you're using a reasonably small aperture, but when you're using a camera like a D850 or a D810 uh, or a Z7, or you know potentially even as Z6 or a D750 or something with 24 megapixels, less noticeable on those bodies, but it is still a factor. As I've talked about before, when the diaphragm is very, very tiny, when the light hits those aperture blades, it causes diffraction. So you get a kind of less than optimum or less than sharp uh, image. It's usually the subject that's closest that you notice it in. But if you are doing a landscape, you will notice that the subjects further back will also um, show some signs of diffraction. So when you're using those high resolution sensors, Nikon don't recommend that you use an aperture smaller than f8. I have gotten away with using smaller apertures and it does depend on how big a screen you're going to look at. If you're going to look at it on a 30 inch monitor or something like that, yes, you will notice diffraction. If you're going to look at it on your phone, probably won't notice it so much. So that's just a little point to remember. As so many people who first learn about aperture then immediately get excited and go, oh, well, I'm going to shoot at f32 and f32 is going to solve all my problems because then everything will be sharp and in focus, but it's usually not the case. So um, find a happy medium use the hyperfocal distances or use the principle of, of shooting a third into the frame, focusing there so that most of your subject is in focus. If you've got, you know, you're using digital cameras, so you can also do trial and error, of course. Um, and as I mentioned in a few previous streams, the other way that you can get around having an entire frame in focus is to use focus stacking. So focus stacking isn't just used for close-ups, as many of you will realize. Um, it is also used for landscape photography and telephoto lenses are just as good for focus stacking as anything else. So there we go. That's on the telephoto lenses. Now let's talk about wide angles. Now wide angles, I'm just gonna comment, just blipped up. Oh, I missed uh, Studio Renee. I'm so sorry, I miss thank you so much. Everyone give them a round of applause for the um, 10 euros 99, which, I have no idea how much that is in coffee money, but it's more than one cup of coffee, that's for sure. Thank you very much. Um, Stephen has been told, D850, not to go past F11. F8 may be technically correct, but you can push it a bit more. Yeah, I find the same thing, Stephen. With the D850, I have shot at F16. Shh, don't tell anyone. <laughs> no, I have shot at F16. and. To be honest, for some things it's not noticeable, for other things it is, it varies. So, um, but but the recommendations from Nikon are generally, you know, stick to those lower apertures so that you don't get diffraction because otherwise, you know, you want your pictures to be as sharp as possible. You've got all that lovely resolution and then you put it at a tiny aperture and you get diffraction. There's nothing, you can't fix diffraction in post-processing. So yeah, exactly. All right, so wide angle lenses. I talk about close-ups for wide-angle lenses quite frequently. Um, and in fact, last, <laughs> what day of the week was it? It was last Tuesday when I was talking about flower portraiture and, um, you know, just getting close and using various different lenses for it. I use a lot of wide-angle lenses for close-ups. So I was going to show you a few examples. <laughs> John says, be careful with diffraction. I shoot at f36. <laughs> Well, and your shots are great, John. So, you know, <laughs> so no one's complaining there. All right, so let me find, I have some pictures, if I can find them, here we go, of some wide angles used for, um, yeah, Nikon are always conservative. They will give you a conservative uh, kind of recommendation because if they don't, they get in trouble. So we have to forgive them that and I can understand why they would do that. All right, so I'm gonna show you, once I've flipped my screen over, these are some shots using wide angle lenses for unconventional wide angle purposes. The first one is a shot by Simon. This is um, taken using the 17 to 55, I believe. And the 17 to 55 is generally considered, uh, it's, not a, it's not just a wide angle lens, it's kind of, it's a 2470 equivalent in FX terms. So this would be the 24 end, which is quite wide for a portrait, but you've got this kind of almost environmental portraiture look because you've got the background and it gives some context to the person being photographed. The same with this one, which was taken with the 14 to 24. Again, 14 to 24 is definitely not a normal portrait lens. People don't use them for portraiture. Um, and yet this works really well because you've got this lovely contextual background and then you've got the subject 
perfectly isolated. Now, again, with wide angle lenses, the closer you get, the better. And I'm going to show you my close ups in a minute, some of which you will have seen. Um, this is taken with fisheye. Obviously, you wouldn't think of using a fisheye for um, a kind of in on the job portraiture, if you like. Um, but the great thing about the fisheye is that it kind of lends to the cozy atmosphere of this shot. Um, I don't remember which fisheye he used. Let me just have a very quick look. This is the 16 mil fisheye. There we go. So you can kind of see how, although you wouldn't normally use a, a fisheye lens for portraiture, it's actually really worked in this instance. Now this was taken, this is by me. This was just taken with the 24 1.8 probably wide open. It was a long time ago, I don't remember. It was when the lens first came out. Um, and again, getting super close to the subject means that the background is nice and isolated. This one I showed you the other day, and I think it's on my Instagram feed as well. I've got a lot of pictures on my Instagram shot using the 21.8, um, just because I went out with it this weekend and I, and I shot a lot with it. And I took loads of flower pictures and close-ups and some portraits of my kids and stuff like that all with the 21.8Z. Um, now this lens closes, sorry, focuses as close as uh, two, I believe it is, two, 1.6 or two centimeters. It's very, very close. It gets ridiculously close. You're almost bumping into the subject. Um, and by getting very, very close to the subject, you then get this wonderful out of focus background. You can't see anything in the background there at all. I took some others, but that was probably the most impressive of the lot of them, um, which is why I'm, I'm sharing that one in particular. But you will find that if you get close, nice and close, I, I showed you on Tuesday, it was, <laughs> a lot happened on Tuesday, um, pictures of books that I'd taken and flowers and things like that, all taken with the 24, um, with the 20, with the 24 to 70 at the widest end, with the 35. They're all kind of wide angle lenses and yet you can get very close. Um, so certainly if you've got just wide lenses and I up until quite recently just really stuck to the wide end as much as I could, um, you can use those for close ups and portraiture, no problem. Just get a bit closer to the subject. The problem, now I'm always gonna talk about the caveats when I talk about the, the benefits of that. Clo wide angle lenses, because of the nature of their field of view, they will cause you a bit of distortion. So the close, obviously you're talking about a round piece of glass, right? So the lens is round. Let me find on the camera, look at this monster. <laughs> this is the 20 1.8Z. Um, it is a colossal lens. Eves has got one if he's with us. He's been taking pictures with that. So because the front of the lens is round and the elements are curved, you will end up, if your subject is near the, let's say the outer edge of your frame, you will end up with some distortion. Um, what a lot of people do when they come to the shop and they're taking pictures with, or they're testing out wide angle lenses is they will take a picture in the center of the shop and then they'll have a look at the cabinets and see if they bowed slightly. Um, that's an obvious sign of distortion the closer you get to the subject, the more distortion will become apparent. So if you do take portraits with a wide angle lens, if your subject is very close and also slightly off center, you will find some distortion in their face. Wide angles aren't generally considered very flattering for portraiture, but you can get around it by keeping the subject sort of in the middle portion of the frame and also just not being as close to them. If you take a step back, you'll reduce some distortion. Shooting at smaller apertures will also again help you in that instance because um, the wider the aperture on these lenses, the more noticeable things like distortion are, but also things like vignetting um, and any chromatic aberration that you might normally experience will be more noticeable at the wider apertures than if you're shooting a little bit stop down. So there's some tips for using wide angles. The last one is macro lenses. Most of you know that you can use macro lenses for other purposes. I used to use my 60 mil as my 50. It was my 50 lens. I had a 50, I just never used it. So I ended up sticking with my 60. I now have the, uh, as I've had for a few years, the 55 uh, AI 
which I use as my 50 now, but it's a very similar vocal length to the 60. Um, so I don't have super flattering pictures. My kids are going to hate me for sharing these with you, but I thought I'm just gonna give you a couple of examples of some portraits taken with a 60 mil macro. These are when, and some general purpose. This is when my kids were very small and they refused to admit that they were little ones. <laughs> That's how grown up they are now. So um, this was with the 60 mil F2.8. I mean, this was back when I was using, I think a D700, uh, possibly the D600, I can't quite remember. Um, and it was quite a gloomy day, but a lovely little portrait of a very small person, must've been about three then I think. Um, this I think was the following year. Again, my 11 year old will hate me for this. <laughs> But it is possible to take portraits with macro lenses. I'm sorry I don't have any better examples. I was just retrieving the first ones that I could find on my hard drive. And then this is perhaps a little bit more of a general purpose shot that you might think is taken with a wider lens than it is, but it's taken with the 60 mil macro. Um, quite often, if you recognize this greenhouse, this is Kew Gardens, quite often when I went to Kew, I would just take the macro lens and nothing else. So I would just you know, I'd make do with what I had. And the 60 was um, was my macro lens and still is the one that I kind of go to all the time. So you can absolutely get away with taking that out and using it as a general purpose lens, no problems. Um, so those are, those are it for the examples for you. Now, I wanna talk about primes and zooms. There are some pros and cons to both. I'm also just gonna check the comments because I haven't been paying attention. Um, Oh, thank you, David. Thank you very much. Yay, everyone give David a round of applause. Um, Z lenses have less distortion than the F mount versions. Well, actually, yes and no. There's the, the software in the Z lenses is doing a lot of work, a lot of work. So if you turn off all that stuff, they the lens constructions are slightly better. They're slightly closer to the sensor. Um, there's various reasons why the Z lenses are better and sharper newest optics does definitely help but there's also a lot of distortion control vignette control various other things that are going in on in the camera and the camera is making up for some of the let's say sh uh, short falls is that a word i think it is um of the lenses uh 105 2.8 is my fave for portrait yeah have to move the legs a bit sometimes yeah no david i agree i think the 105 is a lovely portrait lens um i am going to show you some pictures using my, probably my all time favorite Nikon lens shortly, but that's not relevant to what I'm talking about right now this second. So I'm gonna talk about, so primes versus zooms. The common, uh, not misconception, but the common idea is that primes are better than zooms. They are better quality. This is not inaccurate um, for the most part. The primes have less work to do. They're only doing one job effectively. Um, they are more compact. They are generally slightly sharper and they also produce slightly better bokeh often. But that, as I talked about a couple of days ago, has a lot to do with the number of aperture blades and therefore the shape that the aperture comes out in. So that's primes, whereas zooms are convenient. Sometimes you lose a bit of quality. Sometimes you end up with a much smaller aperture than you would get with a prime um, and they tend to be bigger and heftier. But that's not always the case. So a few years ago, Nikon released, and they were very quiet about it because they are quite conservative about their developments. They released some information about how they had changed the way that they test optics so that they were, a, it was a very, very rigorous testing procedure for their newer optics. This probably came about, I don't know, I'm gonna say five, six years ago, it might be longer. My judgment of time of when developments happen has changed a little bit. And they may have been using it for longer, but essentially since then I've noticed we've had additional coatings. We've had what they have on the new big telephotos like Arneo coatings. We've got, we've had um, upgrades of extra low dispersion glass, nano crystal coats, all of that stuff has been changed and modified. So you will find that if you're buying a new lens straight off the market at the at the outset it will probably be slightly improved at least a little bit but but quite a lot over the previous version um one that confuses people quite a lot is the 70 to 200 there were so many iterations of the 80 to 200 then the 70 to 200 and nikon were constantly through each iteration just slowly improving things actually the earlier versions of the lens the 80 to 200 the push-pull one 
which has that sort of sliding mechanism instead of the, the two-touch zoom. They had two versions of that. They had two versions of a two-touch. One had a motor in it, the AFS. One didn't. That's what we called the N version because it was the newest type. They still make that for the Japanese and the US market. I don't know why they missed us out of that. But there's a few D lenses and oddities that they make for some markets and not others. Um, and then when it came to the 70 to 200s, 2.8s. Okay, so same lens as the 80 to 200 essentially. It was filling that same gap. Um, but the VR1 was the one that every professional had, only to find that when full frame cameras really came into their own, it vignetted a little bit on the D700 and the D3. So they came out with a VR2 version. The VR2 version didn't vignette, but it had a bit of a, what they call a focus breathing issue. So if you were shooting a subject very close, the 200 mil end would actually only give you the equivalent of a 135 millimeters. Try and bend your head around that. So <laughs> and then now we have the FL version, which is kind of the cream of the crop. And we have the Z version, which I think I wish I had a pound for every time someone asks me when that's coming out. I don't know. I still don't know. I wish I knew. Um, I've heard some peculiar rumours that there are some being released here, there and everywhere. So possibly in the US they've released a couple. Certainly some of the MPS guys have gotten them. If you've pre-ordered one or you're on our waiting list, don't worry. I have not forgotten about you. I just physically don't have the lenses yet. So as soon as I do, I'll let you know. But that just gives you an idea. It's the best example because there are there are four, five, six, seven, plus the manual focus version. So like eight or nine iterations of that same lens. Um, generally speaking, the newer ones tend to have the latest improvements in them. I would say, just as a warning, don't always look at the initial reviews. If you're going to buy a new lens, don't look at the first look reviews. I mean, look at them, but then take a take them all with a bit of a pinch of salt, because usually the people that are doing the first look reviews will not have had time, first of all, to test them thoroughly. They may have gotten pre-production models, and quite often you don't know how kind of real world their reviews are. So it's always a good idea if you're thinking of buying a new lens and you're not one of those people that gets one as soon as they come out, just to to read the sort of the reviews from people that actually use the lenses as opposed to someone who's going to stick it on a bench and then put it through a machine because that doesn't really necessarily communicate anything. Um, the, the charts are very useful if you need to understand MTF charts and things like that. They can be very useful, but generally speaking, they don't always kind of give you a true idea of what a lens is going to do performance wise when you're out in the field and shooting with it. Um, now, so, so I've talked about the age of optics. Some th There was another point that came up about a week ago with using these older lenses on higher resolution bodies. They won't necessarily always resolve the detail of a high res body. So I tend to use these AI and AIS lenses on my D850 with no problems, but I am also not printing billboards I'm not viewing my pictures at 100%. I'm also not heavily post-processing my pictures. I very, very rarely edit them. I'm just too lazy <laughs> for that. Um, if I'm doing a shoot, if I'm doing a wedding or a portrait shoot or a concert, yes, I edit my photos, but then I'm using gear that is age appropriate to my camera. So I will use the 24 to 70, the 1424, the 70 to 200. If I'm just doing stuff for my own delight and pleasure and creativity, I will generally use the manual focus lenses. Um, so bear in mind that with all of these newer lenses, you get new coatings, you get um, quite often, they've been more rigorously tested. They're also designed for digital cameras, whereas the older lenses, including the old AF and AFD lenses, all of those, those were actually designed for film. So of course, the detail and resolution that you would get on film was very different to what we get these days with our super 45 megapixel bodies and who knows what may come in the future. I mean, the sky's the limit, right? I mean, how many more pixels do we need? A lot, apparently. Oh, thank you, Terry. Thank you very, very much. I've just seen your, I'm glad you're enjoying the stream. <laughs> Me waffling on about lenses. It's a topic that I always get very passionate about. Um, okay, so as I've, I wrote a little, I wrote, I've written and underlined this, so I'm just going to read what I wrote. So don't assume because it's old it's and it's not the latest type, it will be bad. But also don't expect every very expensive latest type of lens to be perfect either, because there are always going to be problems with lenses. There's always going to be something that someone doesn't like about it or it's not going to be suited for a certain purpose. So, you know, we don't, the, the perfect lens doesn't exist, I don't think. However, 
<laughs> I want to show you some pictures from my favorite lens shortly. So let me just talk about ranges of lenses quickly. The most common sort of trio is what they call the Holy Trinity. And so many of you will have this 1424, 2470 2.8 and the 70 to 200 2.8. Now I talked about the 70 to 200, the 24 to 70, as you may be familiar, um, they have a VR version which is the latest one. They have a non-VR version, which is the one that was out for years and years. And then they had the older 28 to 70 2.8, which some of you might have had. It was an older AFS style lens. Unfortunately, because of the age of the motor, they do sometimes start to squeak and then eventually the AFS motor just dies. Um, so if you've had one, are looking at selling one, any of those things, it's just something to bear in mind those older AFS motors, if you've got any old lens which has, in fact, any lens at all that has an AFS motor, um, do use it. I mean, the newer lenses, you're not going to, lenses made in the last, you know, five, ten years aren't going to be an issue. But going back from that, I've even seen AFS 70 to 200 2.8G VR1s, the first version, which someone has bought, they have put on their shelf, they've never used, and then they go to use it for the first time and the motor doesn't work because. All of the, um, let me grab a lens, well, I'll grab this one because it's the closest one. So all of the lubricant and stuff that goes inside these lenses, if you don't use it, it dries up, it gets solid, and then the lens won't function anymore. It's the AFS motor that is the, is the cause or the problem. So if you do have an older AFS lens, um, do just use it every couple of weeks. If your lens is squeaking, use it a lot until the squeak goes away just to free up that lubricant because otherwise it will just go completely solid and then the lens will need an entirely new AFS motor which is very expensive and very hard to get hold of so that's a tip for any of you that have one of those older lenses just because people ask difference between the 24 to 70 non VR and VR the VR is slightly sharper yes and it has VR it is also bigger it has the 82 mil front diameter um, it also produces slightly more chromatic aberration particularly when you've got landscapes in the sort of smaller um, sorry not smaller the closer regions of the frame so when you're shooting landscape with the 2470 VR quite a few people notice this strange blue fringing it's normal it can be gotten rid of very quickly in Lightroom I've seen your question Steve I will ask you I will answer you in just a minute um, on that one so that I don't lose my chain of thought so then the 1424 there wasn't a predecessor of it there was the 17 to 35 2.8 which is still made um, but apart from that, we never really had, and there was the 20 to 35 2.8 actually, or 20 to 30, 20 to 30. I have to look it up, but anyways, <laughs> so they had a few kind of wide 2.8s, but nothing like the 1424. So the 1424 is quite a unique lens. Um, and if you kind of, if you're looking at putting together a professional kit, those are the three zooms that most people look at. Now, if you don't have thousands of pounds to spend on lenses and I understand but maybe you have almost thousand pounds of, to spend on lenses then you have the f4 versions the 1635 f4 24 120 f4 70 to 200 f4 those three are also as we like to call the gold band lenses I don't have any of mine up here <laughs> how I'm prepared they're all downstairs anyway my 24 120 is somewhere else in this building um but they're all f4 lenses now you do get a few compromises. The 16 to 35 isn't necessarily as sharp as the 1424 wide open, but it's pretty good. Um, the 24 120 is almost as sharp as the 24 to 70 in that range, but it distorts a bit more at the 24 end and at the 120 end, it is not as sharp, obviously, but it's a slightly longer lens. Uh, the 70 to 200 F4, I can almost say nothing bad about it. It's a fantastic lens. Um, and I'm, I'm not going to complain about it because it's very good. It's also half the size and weight of the 2.8 version. So if you are looking at a kind of F4 equivalent of the Holy Trinity, then those three or a combination, you don't necessarily need all of them, but a combination of those might work. The other one that doesn't get enough um, publicity is the 70 to 300 F4.5 to 5.6, both the GVR and the newer E-Type. Um, they are superb lenses. There was... I did an article, I have it in a Nikon owner magazine here somewhere, on the Big Cat Sanctuary, uh, which is in Ainsford in Kent. Beautiful place. Um, they've been featured on BBC various channels uh, at different times because they um, protect big cats. And I went there 
with um, with my mum actually and Alma who does all the photography for them who's a, a very good friend of the shop um, toured us around and I took the 70 to 300 and I took the 70 to 200 just because I wanted to do some comparisons the 70 to 300 every shot from that lens was perfect and I've and I had the old version before and that was also perfect so I would say it's a very underrated lens you can buy it for just about 500 pounds if you don't want a 2.8 lens, have a look at the 70 to 300. Be careful though, because it's an E lens, so it won't necessarily work on older bodies. But still, if you can if you can pick one of those up, they are they are particularly special. Okay, so to answer Stephen's question, um, Holy Trinity of Primes, he. <laughs> so that's gonna be a tough one. I think if I had a personal choice, I would say the 28 1.4 E, which is a just superb lens. The 58 1.4 G, because that is very special. Um, you either love it or you hate it, I love it. And the 105 1.4 E, which um, is the lens that I wanted to show you pictures from. Now, I've gotten to, I've had the great uh, privilege and honor of using this a few times, not this set of shots. Just these, just these two shots. I've actually got a whole day's worth of shooting with the 105 1.4. But, um, but I just wanted to show you these couple because I, I think this was the the shoot that made me fall in love with this lens. I did this shoot with Nikon, um, and we had we had a whole. It was actually I think when the D5s first came out, we had so much uh, equipment at our disposal, and I basically just took the 105 and used it the entire day. But it is incredibly sharp. The depth of field is ridiculously shallow. So even at 1.4, I mean, this these two shots were taken um, at about 2.8 or thereabouts. I think this one was taken at 2.8 because the shot before this, I shot at 1.4 and only one eye was in focus. Um, that's how shallow the depth of field is. But it is the 28 1.4, um, the 58 1.4 because it's a bit special and the 105 1.4 are three lenses that I would say are very very close to my heart and if you wanted just the best of the best primes because there isn't a 50 mil that is kind of considered for professionals the 50 mil lenses actually tend to be a bit more in fact let me just show you this is Nikon's website here so they're lenses for their prime lenses unfortunately the way that they lay this out is ridiculous <laughs> but let's just say people and events as they bundle travel and landscapes together so their 50 mil lenses if they've got them here they've got the special edition fine whatever their 50 mil lenses aren't geared for professionals whereas the 58 1.4 very much is so although it's a slightly weird focal length it's actually just that little bit more unique and different to just a bulk standard 50. The 51.8 and the 51.4, either is great. The 1.8G is actually slightly newer than the 1.4, so it focuses. This special edition, this one with the little chrome waistband here, is actually just the, the version that came with the DF, but is actually optically no different to the normal one. Let's see what it does if I show all. Here we go. It's the same thing. This and this, same thing. You just pay more for the little chrome waistband um, if you want to. And then the old D versions. I mean, they have changed the optics in these. The focusing is much quieter and faster on the new G versions. But essentially, a 50 is just a good old standard 50. Whereas if you want something just a little bit different, then the 58 is a great one to look at. The um, the 28, which of course it doesn't... Oh, yes, it does. Let's sit here. So the 28 1.4 and the 105, those two are two of the kind of newer lenses of the Prime lineup. And they've done such an incredible job with these, I, I cannot fault them. Um, so, so anyway, that those are what I would say the holy trinity. But if you if you don't like the 28 focal length, the 35s are very good. Um, I use a 20 because I like the super wide angle. I don't think it's going to be on this page, unfortunately. But they're, it's all a little bit over all over the place there um, thing. But this is just general people and events. Let's go back to travel and landscape and see if it shows the primes. It may, it may not. Shows the 28. Uh, 24 1.8 is also very good. And the 20, which is over here. Those are all fantastic wide angles. The 35 is a kind of happy medium if you don't like the 50 focal lengths all that much. And then you've got the 85. So the, the more common pairing, let me just switch over so you can see me. So the more common kind of setup is a wide angle, a mid range and a portrait lens. 
this is why I picked the 28, the 58, and the, the 105, but some people don't like that, that set of focal lengths. So they will go 24, 50, and then 85, which are also could be considered a form of holy trinity of lenses. Um, they have 1.4 and 1.8 versions in all of them. I would say it's very difficult for me to hands on heart say that the 1.4s are all better. I used 1.8s for a long time. The 20 1.8 is fantastic. For example, there isn't a 1.4 version. Um, but in some cases, it doesn't make that much difference. It not in practical terms. The 85 1.8 is a fantastic, fantastic lens, but very slow to focus. You wait half an hour, you put, push finger down and then <laughs> sometime later, if the subject is still there, you'll get focus. It's quite slow. I'm exaggerating, of course, but it is, it is a reasonably slow lens, whereas the 1.4 is just the best of the best. So, you know, there's a few, <laughs> there's a few kind of gives and takes on all of those. You're welcome, Steve. Uh, John has the 85 1.4. That is very good. Yes, I agree. I think it is a lovely lens. I used the 1.8 a fair bit for weddings back in a few years ago and um, apart from the slow focus it was also lovely I at the time I didn't want to buy a 1.4 because it's not a focal length I use very much but the 35 1.4 versus the 1.8 is just that little bit more special um, and is much more expensive <laughs> all right so um, last thing I wanted to talk about was the super telephoto lenses so we've managed to get up so far what I've talked about has taken us up to about 200 tops 300 millimeters so what do you do when you want to get super far away now the 80 to 400 a lot of people know this lens the older version is another lens that took half a century to focus when you pressed your buttons um yes ed you're quite right i need to um talk about the 180 thank you for reminding me um so the 80 to 400 I found the newer version was much sharper. It had, it was a newer VR. The original version was actually the first ever VR lens Nikon made. And you can kind of tell from its design, it still had an aperture ring. It was very slow to focus. Um, the 80 to 400 G VR 4.5 to 5.6, the current version, um, kind of overlaps quite a lot with the 70 to 200. So most people will have one or the other. If, um, if you're looking at a lens that you need to get you up to that focal length and the 80 to 400 makes sense. The other thing you could do if you've already got a 70 to 200 is add a 200 to 500. Um, the 200 to 500, a lot of people I know here have it. And although there are some compromises, of course, it's a thousand pounds, give or take, instead of 2000 pounds or instead of the 180 to 400, which is ten thousand pounds you know there's like a big difference in price so you do get a little bit of a compromise but in terms of value for money the 200 to 500 is fantastic i'm pretty sure that someone's going to say something uh to to corroborate that um what about the z lens donald ask me yes there are z lenses i know i've been just talking about the um f mount lenses but the the z lenses because there's such a limited range i can't really compare them whereas with the f mount lenses God, we've had so many. We've had them going straight back to the um, beginning of the 1960s. So it's quite easy to compare F-mount lenses with Z-mount lenses. A few people ask, are the Z-mount lenses better than the F-mount lenses? Um, and Nick was talking about how you get less distortion with, with those wide angles. And that's certainly true. If you've got a Z camera, ideally, yes, the native Z lens is going to work slightly better. It also will focus slightly faster. I've seen um, a few examples. What is the name of that delightful chap that does those videos? I linked him last week. Steve Perry, I think his name is. Um, so he had the Z with the FTZ, Z7, I think, or Z6, with the FTZ and the 500 PF. And then he had it on his D850 and he pushed the button at the same time and it took twice as long for that to focus on the Z as it did on the D850. Whereas when he used a native 24 to 70 and a native F mount D850, push those same amount of time or slightly faster on the Z camera. So definitely if you've got a Z camera and the lens is available to you and you want to spend the money on it, then it will focus faster and it will perhaps perform slightly better. Um, but 
there aren't enough for me to compare, to be honest. <laughs> so um, I had to return my 200 to 500. Yeah, see, some people don't like it. See, some people love it, some people hate it. I like the 200 to 500. It's just so big. The 80 to 400 is smaller and lighter, covers a bigger range, compromises a little bit in some of the focal lengths. Um, they both use teleconverters. So if you've got a body that will focus at f8 um, i hope you know all what that means but if you have a body that will focus with those smaller aperture lenses um, then you can actually get away with also adding teleconverters usually the smaller ones like the 1.4 don't plonk a two times converter on there it will slow down incredibly um, and then lastly the 180 to 400 because i can't not talk about it <laughs> it is a beautiful lens it i mean it is a testimony to nikon's ability to create fantastic zooms actually the older 200 200 to 400 which some of those pictures i showed you of simon's were taken with simon was a, a very avid user of the 200 to 400 for a long long time um and i used to find that at the 400 end the 200 to 400 wasn't that sharp whereas the 180 to 400 kind of excels throughout the range which you would expect considering the price point of it so as i mentioned the other day but some of you might have missed the new 120 to 300 2.8 which We've had a very tiny shipment of, and some of our customers are already using. I'm really looking forward to their responses, by the way, because I haven't had a chance to um, get any feedback from them. But the 120 to 300 2.8, the, the concept behind it, as I was speaking to Rishi from the Nikon School uh, a couple of months ago, was... You know, there's so many different lenses that Nikon needed to replace. The 180 2.8, as I think Ed was mentioning, yeah beautiful lens but it's a d lens it came out 20 years ago and it needs an update the 135 dc lenses both the 105 and the 135 um f2 dcs fantastic lenses very very sharp but not on modern optics they don't really work on the d850 very well there's loads of front and back focusing and calibration needed and stuff um the 200 f2 incredible lens needs an update the 300 2.8 probably doesn't need an update but anyway so the 120 to 300 2.8 um is kind of a replacement for all of those lenses they the proof of concept was in the 180 to 400 it was like yes we can produce a lens that is as sharp or almost as sharp as a, a whole set of primes um, and plonk it in a great big zoom so that's what they've done with the 120 to 300 it's a shame it doesn't have a built-in teleconverter as far as i know it works with teleconverters it's a shame it doesn't have a drop-in filter holder for polarizers. Yes, that is disappointing. I'm sure that someone will come up with something that you can plonk on the front, though. It's really big. I, I haven't seen one in the flesh, but I know that it's a very big front element. Um, but those kind of lenses, the 120 to 300, the 180 to 400, they are proof that Nikon can make zooms that are as good as Prime. So if you've ever got any question as to whether or not a zoom is, is going to be better than a Prime, often no but it's more convenient so um if you've got that extra money to burn <laughs> then why not get the best thing that money can buy right so um i just was seeing some of the other random one the other random one seemed soft that the 200 to 400 200 to 500 it seems soft it, it compared to a prime yes it would i would think um and also you know there's always calibration things and stuff that can be done um 80 to 400 too slow too slow especially at nighttime football international games that i would believe um i did most of my shooting with it in broad daylight never had a problem but i could understand it struggles a lot when you put a teleconverter on it as well um particularly if you put like a 1.7 the 1.4 is fine but the 1.7 and the two times you lose your focusing almost entirely so um it needs a lot of light the lens works very very hard uh waiting to purchase a 600 f4 for my retirement should i wait for the z version i don't know how long you'll be waiting <laughs> the only thought rob depends on how far away your retirement is if it's soon then it's going to be probably at least a year or two or three before we see a, a z version but if you want to future proof yourself then yeah sure um wait for the z version if you're not in a hurry um i have noticed that some of the lenses are becoming slightly harder to get hold of for example the the big primes we used to keep one of each in stock we now generally don't keep them in stock we will just order them when someone wants one um, and sometimes they'll be out of stock with nikon for a few weeks 
or longer. So, you know, if you're thinking of getting a telephoto lens, do check with us um, whether or not we've got it. <laughs> I guess otherwise you might be waiting even longer than you thought. Um, so Nikan waiting, uh, thinking of replacing my 70 to 200 2.8e with the 120 to 300 2.8 and keeping the 400 2.8 for action or sports. I can understand that. I mean, I think wait for the the kind of real life reviews on the 120 to 300 to come out. Um, and if you don't use that wider end of your 70 to 200 all that often, that makes sense. Uh, Terry uses the 200 to 500. Steven uses the 200 to 500. Yes, I agree. It's very good. Very, very good value for money. Um, I think that's pretty much everyone's, that everyone's questions. It's seen a screw in front glass from a third party for the 120 to 300. I thought someone would do that because it seems a bit strange that they don't have the drop-in filter. For those of you that don't know, those big lenses, rather than having a filter on the front, they have this little drop-in filter at the back, which is very useful um, for, yes, I took the 500 PF home. <laughs> <laughs> don't judge me <laughs> so the um the drop-in filter for polarizing on those long lenses is very handy um and i don't know how you would put a polarizer on otherwise except putting it on the front so hopefully that 120 to 300 will have some kind of because the 500 pf is already as big as it gets and the 200 to 500 is 95 mil so that's a really big and we we struggled. Hoya don't make a polarizer for this one. Only Kenko do, which are a sister company of Hoya. Um, so I can't imagine how, I can't imagine it being easy for us to get an even bigger polarizer. But that was the, the biggest problem was that if you're doing um, wildlife in Africa or something like, or a very sunny location, you usually want to put a polarizer on. So not having the drop-in filter seemed a bit of a strange move but hopefully the 120 to 300 otherwise will turn out to be as good as the 180 to 400 that is what I'm truly hoping um for the for those of you uh who are not familiar with the 180 to 400 it also has a built-in teleconverter so you can actually it's a 1.8 times I think and you can actually extend the focal length of the lens just by flicking a switch so it's very very cool uh, 300 PF is also lovely. The other random one. Yes, it is. Um, it is another lens that I'm a big fan of. So if you want a telephoto and you don't need a zoom, then have a look at the PF versions of the lenses. 300 PF is like this big, it's very small. And the 500 is very big and chunky, but, um, but actually it's not as chunky as most other lenses. And in fact, it's smaller than the 200 to 500. So there we go. All right, I think that I think I covered everything that I wanted to talk about. I'm just going to double check my notes <laughs> because uh, because I got sidetracked by all the questions, but I loved all the questions. It was fantastic. And as you know, I can talk about lenses all the time. Um, yes, I will. I will put the link for the hyperfocal distance calculator. Um, in fact, let me do that right now so that you guys can if you want to, if you're feeling super nerdy, you can actually just calculate your hyperfocal distances if you want to shoot with your telephoto lenses or any lens um, and do landscape and you want the whole thing to be in focus or do focus stacking one or the other i hope that you um spend the next couple of days just going out and taking photos that you maybe wouldn't normally take with the lenses that you've got um if there is a lens that you desperately need the Grace Westminster website is there. There's always someone on duty to get your lenses sent out. Obviously, we can't send out every day of the week, but we can send out as frequently as possible. Um, if you have any questions for me, drop me an email, pop a comment in, or however other means necessary you would like to um, send me a question, I will answer them as the best my, of my ability. You're very welcome, David, John, everybody. And, uh, and don't forget, you can contribute to the Coffee Fund at any time using the PayPal link. We have great big plans for that coffee fund and it's not a giant bucket of coffee. <laughs> it's other plans. Um, all right, everybody. I will see you on Thursday for a very exciting stream. I am excited about what's coming on Thursday. So, um, so I will see you then. Have a wonderful rest of your Tuesday and your Wednesday. Everybody take care. You're welcome. <laughs> all right. Bye.